You asked and Imperial listened. Due to extreme popularity and brewer demand, the A44 Kvyking blend is being released as a year-round available strain. This blend of three proprietary Kvyke strains absolutely loves hot fermentations, producing beers bursting with fruity notes of pineapple, guava, and tropical flavors. Use it for your summer Blondales, your hazy IPA, or anything else you want to have a delectable fruity fermentation character. And A44 is absolutely perfect for those who may not have the ability to precisely control fermentation temperatures. Just pitch your pouch and let her rip. Pick up your homebrew pouch where Wherever Imperial Yeast is sold and place commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. It's true that IPA has been around for quite a long time. Sure, there's some contradictory evidence regarding its advent, but regardless, I think a lot of us are quite happy it's around today. Now, while IPA tends to have higher levels of alcohol than other styles of beer, what it's really known for is its massive hop aroma and flavor, which is hugely a function of a technique known as dry hopping. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And in this episode, I'm joined by contributor Cade Job to discuss the unique method of adding dry hop additions at yeast pitch, particularly as it pertains to hazy New England IPA. Yeah, I love talking about IPA and all of the different ways that you can add hops to beer. I mean, this is like, if you think about the style IPA, I mean, really what that means for a lot of people is just hops, 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 right? But you never you, you never really get into, or at least we don't um, talk about it all that often, when to add hops. Like when adding hops does XYZ thing. I think there's a lot of, um, I'm not going to say dogma, there's a lot of very strongly held beliefs out there about when you're supposed to do hops, you know, to get certain aspects of uh, flavor and aroma and some of that's supported by science some of it's not but this uh, but this question of pitching hops at yeast pitch is a really fascinating one because it's not one that was done very common before we started talking about new england ipa or maybe it was done commonly maybe it just wasn't as publicized um you know but uh i, I think this one's really cool we're also going to talk a little bit about new england ipa today so uh, for all you uh any ipa fanboys out there we're going to talk about that as yeah, well yeah now, i'm not brewing too many dry hopped beers these days i feel like i sort of got that out of my system years ago and there's so many available commercial uh, commercially that i that I just drink what I want when I want it and brew other stuff. But this idea of dry hopping at yeast pitch is something I've actually spent some time thinking about. Uh, this is going to be an interesting topic to chat about with you, Cade. Now, before we move on, you've got some pretty big news to share, Cade. Yeah, I know. I feel like 2020 has been a year of news for me. I uh, started January by uh, ditching the lawyer gig and going to work at a brewery. Um, and now I'm, uh, I've am i decided to, I've, I'm enrolled and I'm starting the Oregon State Fermentation Science Program. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm uh, doing post-baccalaureate studies right now, but eventually going to be doing a master's and PhD through there and hopefully get a job in higher education someplace. That's so awesome. I'm super stoked for you. Uh, we've heard from a lot of listeners who've expressed excitement about our new podcast ideas the brew lab, which we've talked about. And with you moved up to Oregon from Austin, Texas, a pretty big move for you. I feel like now we can start pushing our way through getting that all planned and set up. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's just exciting that you're now at Oregon State University. What a, what a trip, man. I'm super excited. I mean, I think it's going to be really cool, especially that Brew Lab podcast. Uh, you know, now we've got some time to work on it and talking about science, and that's what I'll be doing for a living, and also doing it here on the podcast. I think this. Uh, I think it's going to be really cool. I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah. So are we all excited? And and uh, for those of you who live in the, it's near Corvallis, Oregon, right? If you're in that area, once we get back to collecting data and such, you now have a brewlosopher who is uh, in your neck of the woods. So don't be afraid to reach out and let them know you'd like to participate. All right, if you're a fan of this show and you like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A with somebody in the brewing world coming up later this month. Yours truly will be sitting down with patrons for an hour or so, answering any questions they throw at me. Uh, I'm, I've got very little shame, so e even if it's not brewing related, it's fair game for me. I'll answer it anyways. If this sounds like something you'd enjoy, be sure to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by November 20th, 2020. 
All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Again, that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you're doing your online shopping. Your experience doesn't change at all, and we get a little kickback for the referral that really helps us out. Finally, if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, Not only does it give us an idea of what you think of the show, but it helps those who may not have heard of us yet find it. All right, feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with super-fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com, and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Todd Chisholm had some feedback on the episode where we focused on ways to reduce cold side oxidation, which is probably one of our top five most popular episodes to date. Uh, Todd said this was a super interesting episode. One thing that occurred to me while listening to that is that CO2 will stay in solution much more readily at cold temperatures. If you cold crash after fermenting at warmer temperatures, it's even more important to do a good job purging the keg since there will be less CO2 released during transfer and so even less of the so-called protective blanket. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. I mean, I, I, I guess that makes a lot of sense as I think about it. You know, um, if you cold crash, you're trapping any CO2 or at least uh, maybe holding the CO2 better in solution. So, uh, so yeah, whenever it starts to warm up or get agitated during transfer, uh, you're releasing some of that CO2, which maybe creates a little bit of that blanket. Oh, that's a fascinating way to think about it. I'll, uh, it certainly makes sense intuitively. Um, yeah, very cool. That, that's why I'm at too. Todd, I mean, it seems like Todd's pretty correct about CO2 more readily leaving warmer solutions. We know that's the case uh, compared to colder solutions. So what he's saying makes some sense to me. Uh, not that I've become about cold side oxidation. I don't care what temperature the beer is at packaging. I do everything I can to ensure it never touches oxygen. Uh, so yeah, that's where I'm at. But thanks for the feedback, Todd. We really appreciate it. If you have show feedback. You could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. One of the oldest and biggest breweries in the Fresno area is Tioga Sequoia. And a few years ago, in what I'm guessing was an attempt to match the success of Firestone Walker's 805, uh, they started making California 99 Golden Ale, an easy drinking blonde ale made with a touch of honey that pays homage to this central California city. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. This one smells like an old library. It smells like my great-grandmother's closet. No, uh, I told your great-grandmother a long time ago. To I really don't care for it. <laughs> it just doesn't taste good to me. It actually tastes kind of IPA-ish a little bit to me. It's bitter. It's had that kind of like honey pilsner taste to it. I can't explain it. I just don't like it. Yeah, it's all right. And, and not according to your face. Well, I pounded it, dude, so to speak. It's all right, dude. It's, it's, it finishes smooth. That's good. Yeah. You don't want to get punched in the face. You're like, that's delicious. Ow! You don't want that, right? It's good. It's got some weird flavors in there. Like, I, I feel like... You know when you do those IPAs where it's like this sifting to the bottom, there's like a pile of crap yeah. on the bottom? I don't like those, but this doesn't have that. It's just, no. it finishes and you get a little bit of that flavor. I'm going to force Tim to drink it right now. And see I'm, 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 when I be got, the first time own. we forced Tim to do something. Honestly, the IPA thing, I get it, but I don't Not get it. Uh, here's this. It's smooth, right? So with all these beers. It's definitely smooth. If I served this to you, would you kick me out? I wouldn't kick you out. You'd drink it and you'd like it, wouldn't you? I wouldn't like it, but I would drink it. That's, so friend, you, that's called friendship. I love you, buddy. Okay, I have nothing against California 99 Golden Ale and think it achieves the goal of being simple and easy to drink during these hot summer months, which I think was the plan. Uh, I have no clue what Tim was picking up in his sample, and I was pretty surprised he didn't like this beer because it is so simple. Wow, yeah. I mean, your great-grandmother's closet. Uh, <laughs> that's a, To me, that's mothballs, and I, I, I will never forget the smell of mothballs. I know. And if that's, what he was, I, if that's what he was picking up. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm excited to be on the West Coast and start to try some of this stuff. Uh, I love a good golden ale, and that sounds like something that I would definitely pick up off the shelves. Yeah, it, I mean, it's an easy drinking, you know, really simple, plain golden ale with a little bit of a, I guess, honey character. Uh, I don't get grandma's closet either. I didn't 
smell mothballs. What what the only thing I could surmise is that perhaps all of the people who had been around us and drinking, we were at an event where there was spilled beer everywhere and whatnot. Maybe he was just picking up that. I don't know. Uh, but but I think it's a pretty decent beer. So we had a really good time at the Clovis Ca- Craft Beer Crawl. That is the last of the reviews from that. And so hopefully uh, Tim and Jersey and I are able to get together sooner than later and uh, get more beers reviewed. Uh, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in reviewed by Jersey and Tim on the show, you can email me, Marshall at brewosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on dry hopping New England IPA at Yeast Pitch. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to Grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to Grainfather.com, that's Grainfather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code BrewPod, that's B R U P O D at Atlantic Brew Supply.com. The delicious style we know today as IPA with all of its various modern offshoots uh, simply would not exist if it weren't for dry hopping. In fact, many would contend you cannot make an IPA without adding a hefty dry hop dose. Now, the history uh, many of us were taught about IPA, at least to my awareness, may not totally be accurate. uh, But to my understanding, the underpinnings of dry hopping were fairly well established, no? Uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the history that we were all taught, and I understand there's some dispute about uh, you know uh, the name India Pale Ale and how that style sort certainly came to be. Right. Um, you know, but but uh, you know people that were brewing, especially in like the 1800s, were using hops and they were adding hops to casks uh, so that they could once fermentation was done, you rack the beer into the cask and then you add hops uh, because the the hops did a bunch of things. They added um, some bitterness, some complexity to the malty sweetness of the drink, and they also preserved the beer. For for shipment. I mean, if you think about, and I, I think I've talked about this before on the show, but if you think about how far and how long it took beer to be shipped places, like 
a beer brewed in England or brewed in Germany that's being shipped across the country, even to India or even just to another country in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, that's still going to take weeks or months uh, to get there. You know, so that beer's got to be good. And that was what hops provided, which was uh, that that stability to the beer, that preservative uh, uh, capability, and then also uh, counterbalancing that that uh, that sweetness of malt. So dry hopping has been around for a long, long time. Uh, I mean, I think that there's records that show back in Germany that it was done at least into the in the 1200s. Uh, you know, so we're talking 800 years that, that people have been adding hops uh, to, to beer, uh, which I think is actually kind of funny. There was a point um, in history where hops were actually illegal um, in Germany because uh, at that time, uh, the church, uh, the church's primary source of income was from uh, group tax. Uh, so all the spices, they had the special proprietary herb mix and they were taxing uh, sales of Groot. Um, so the, 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 so the King actually made it illegal to, uh, put hops in beer because he didn't want to, um, want to hurt that tax income. Yeah. I, um, I believe it was Malcolm who made a comment a while back that, that the history of beer really is driven by taxing and, and where we're at today with beer. Well, it's, it's hugely a function of the taxes that were placed on certain ingredients and such back in the day. Uh, what's interesting to me about dry hopping, like you said, you know, that there was a preservative function to it. I think it, it also provides provided a, a punch of, of perceived freshness uh, in beers that may, like you said, may have been around for a long time and, you know, we're getting put on a ship or, or, or a cart and carried for two or three weeks in a, in a barrel. So there's a lot of things that dry hopping can do. My understanding typically was that it was the, the hops were added to the barrel uh, once it was, you know, out of the fermenter and completely done fermenting. And again, the idea to be prever preservative, but also a dose of that kind of fresh, fresh character to, to uh, brighten up that beer. Yeah, I mean, this is where we uh, this is where we talk about, you know, like the the reason we dry hop now, right? Obviously, we we, we still do care about preservative, uh, but you know, with modern stainless steel brewing equipment and our control over processes and sanitation and cleaning, you know, we're not we're not as worried, uh, you know, about hop stability or about beer stability, and especially depending on how fast uh, how fast y'all drink. I know I can finish off a keg uh, before it's going to go bad, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but it, that that's what we talk about now, at least modern. Um, is the flavor impact that hops can add and adding hops at different parts of the brewing processes, you know, adding it at the first word or boil or, or, or whatever. And, and uh, dry hop specifically adding specific flavors and aromas that are unique and fresh, like you said, and add uh, this complexity to the beer. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it makes sense. You know, if you think about the fact that that way back then, the, 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 you know, what we're told about dry hopping and, and what it was used for these brewers were were adding those hops way at the tail end. I mean, they were obviously throwing some in the, ke the kettle like we all do, uh, but then adding that big dry hop dose to the finished fermenting beer uh, like many things in brewing that we've <laughs> that we've um, I guess adapted for modern use, we we also didn't really change it much. So we we look at the idea that they're adding hops to this finished beer. That must be the right way to do it. Well, yeah. I mean, I always I always kind of go back to this in my brewing practice. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, you know, uh, and if if the beer tastes good, uh, you know why why do anything different? I mean, yeah. you and I, you and I, um, and I think everybody with philosophy and probably our listeners and readers are are of sort of that mentality that well, you know, maybe there's something better out there, or maybe we can do things differently to save some time or save right. some ingredients or processes or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you talked about adding hops. I mean, it's right. We do. We add hops at the at you know sometimes at first wort so getting those fresh runnings uh right off of the mash tun um uh into the kettle adding hops so that they're swirling around before you even get started boiling adding hops early in the boil uh you know for bitterness adding hops in the middle and late boil for flavor and aroma then we start talking about whirlpool hops which is while the beer is curling you know cooling down and you're trying to coagulate sort of all of the trube and everything down in the middle of the kettle and then uh you know dry hopping. So there's a fascinating array of options that we have for adding hops uh, to beer. Uh, and a lot of things, a lot of research still going into this even today. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, I think it's a huge focus. I mean, you look at uh, Scott Janish's book, The New IPA, 
it, there, I mean, that, that is a book about hops <laughs> in essence, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it's such a huge part of modern hoppy IPA, uh, it, that it's, it makes sense that it's getting all of that attention. Now, uh, it, when I think about dry hopping, uh, I kind of have to go back to when I started brewing IPA a, a decade or so ago. And back then it was the, all, you know, the talk was you let your beer ferment out and then you add in your dry hops. You leave it for, I don't know, a year or two. It was, <laughs> people always wanted to leave it longer, it seemed. Uh, back then, I think it was actually like two weeks was pretty typical. Seven days to seven to 14 days was pretty typical. Uh, and then you and then you package your beer like normal. Um, things have changed. They've kind of morphed a little bit. And for various reasons, perhaps we can talk a little bit about why we're kind of rethinking methods for dry hopping. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's so much research that's been done on this, even just in the last couple of years uh, that, that have really changed uh, the way that the way that we talk about adding dry hops and the way that we're that we're doing it. Um, you know, like, for example, the Oregon State um, labs, uh, Shellhammer's lab specifically uh, released a study a few years ago that was talking about how, uh, you know, certain hops extract all of their uh, hop oils, aroma and, flow, aroma and flavor, or at least a majority of it within 24 hours. Yeah, yeah it's um, nuts. You know, so so this idea that we have to dry hop for two weeks, three weeks, a month, you know, six months, a, a year. I, I've never dry hopped for a year. Um, <laughs> I, I was really joking. To. Yeah, I was joking. <laughs> Okay, all right. All right. I wasn't sure if there was some some uh, uh, strange style that I just hadn't heard of, but um, but no, I mean, there's there's so much research that's going on about this right now that that about when to add hops and and uh, and what that what that addition does, and you know, this is a frustrating part. It's also a really cool part. Uh, it depends also on the hop itself, right? So Cascade may act differently than Centennial or than Citra or than uh, Tetnanger or uh, EKG right. or any or you know any of the other hops, which is just so fascinating because you have these you know um, hop oils, uh, terpenes, thiols, all these flavor uh, and aroma contributing uh, substances that do different things at different times and react differently with the different chemicals in the beer, which yeah. I think is just so fascinating. So when I first started dry hopping, um, I was sort of in the one week uh, to two week range yeah. whenever I first started. And so I, I dropped the, I dropped the hops in there really at the tail end of fermentation, uh, not really knowing why. And then, um, <laughs> I'd let it sit for about a week or, or, you know, get to that 10 day, you know, two week mark or so that I was just sort of arbitrarily waiting for, for my beer to be done. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that's how I did it. I, I think it's fascinating. And especially the, one of the biggest things I learned at Blue Owl is um, at a commercial level, this stuff really matters uh, when to add hops yeah. because, you know, if I can add hops at a certain point, that means my beer may be done faster. If I have to wait all the way until the beer is completely finished to then add hops and then wait, you know, three or four or five uh, days or a week or two weeks after that, yeah. that means that that beer is sitting in the tank and I can't get that out to sell. That's right. That's right. Well, and then there are other reasons one might consider uh, changing the, their dry hopping routine, at least from the old school approach that I was taught. At least, you know, you, you wait till that beer is finished and then you know, finish fermenting. Then you add your hops, then you let it sit, then you package it. I recall, I believe I was looking up a Union Jack clone recipe, probably eight, nine years ago. Uh, I was just, you know, I wanted to, I was researching for an IPA that I was planning to make. And in the notes, it was, uh, uh, I read that you want to add the dry hop charge about 80% into fermentation. So not not once the beer's done fermenting as I'd been taught, but when there's still about 20% left. So about you know two degrees Play-Doh or so left to go uh, in that fermentation. The idea being that it'll scrub any oxygen introduced uh, from the actual dry, the, the process of adding those hops into the beer. Yeah, totally. And, and, and I think this one is probably what is most common for commercial brewers um, it is that 80% attenuation or not 80% attenuation, but 80% of the fermentation is complete or getting around uh, to use a commercial metric around one degree Play-Doh away from the final gravity uh, or what your expected final gravity is. Right. Uh, that way you've still got a little bit of yeast activity in there to do exactly what you said, which is scrub oxygen. Um, but there's also 
also uh, hops are more soluble um, in ethanol or the hop oils and, and flavor compounds are more soluble in ethanol than they are just in uh, in wort, uh, which I think is also an interesting thing. I mean, there's also there there are a lot of pros and cons about this. You know, if you're trying to do yeast harvesting, yeah. um, you know, waiting as late as you can uh, for fermentation to get those, you know, to get good. Uh, good yeast, uh, healthy, uh, repitchable yeast that you can pitch into your next beer. You don't want to dump a whole bunch of dry hops on it and have all this like messy dry hop stuff that you're pulling out with your yeast pitch. Right. Uh, you know, so so waiting until fermentation is done so you can pull that yeast off and then add your uh, add your hops uh, makes a lot of sense, especially for commercial brewers where yeast pitches can be a huge expense, um, yeah. you know, having to buy buy fresh yeast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I spent years uh, use, using this method and, it, you know, it was always kind of a guess for me. I got my system down to the point where I can kind of predict where I'm at with fermentation. And so my, my approach again for to this day, I still kind of rely on this method here, uh, is I'll, once I see active fermentation, high croys and going, I'll let it go for two or three days and, and kind of what, and people say this is the worst gauge, but it's what I do in Oryx. I'll wait till the bubbling in the airlock is at a, at a certain going at kind of a certain rate to indicate that fermentation is starting to dwindle. And then that's when I'll do my dry hop charge. Um, it's still, you know, in doing that, I remember a little, little story time here about, it must have been three or four years ago. Uh, I had the idea that Jersey would come over and brew his first batch of beer all by himself. I would just kind of stand back, guide him, and ha- we had fun with it. So he designed this really interesting beer that was going to be kind of a your Northwest IPA, real piney, a little bit of grapefruit. So we had like a lot of CTZ, uh, you know, some Centennial, some Cascade. It was it looked like it was going to be a really good beer, and so we get this thing made, and we he came over, he did the dry hop charge. Uh, fermentation was probably a little more than 80% complete at this point, but I wanted him to do it. So I didn't go out and add the dry hops. I had to wait till he was off work. Uh, we keg up the beer and pretty, pretty soon after kegging the beer, I, I started pulling off pints going, man, this, there's something with this that just doesn't taste right. Um, and, and so it got a little bit weirder. I, uh, Jersey and I were going to a conference and so we bottled off a, a brewing thing and we bottled off, uh, four or five bottles of this beer to share with people at the conference, even though we're, you know, we're just thinking maybe it wasn't fermented right or something like that. No joke. Uh, just the flight over there. We that it was twenty four, not even twenty four full hours. I don't think when I was, we started cracking these bottles, and this beer had turned a purple color and just had this terrible cloying sweetness to it. That was uh, that made it undrinkable. I mean, I was I, I just went and threw the bottle, dumped all the bottles out and threw them away. Uh, but to me, that was another indicator, kind of in my step toward reconsidering my approach to dry hopping, because of what I later learned was most likely an oxi- uh, oxidation effect. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something that we we, we didn't touch on yet. But yeah, it, it, opening up the fermenter means that uh, uh, you know gases are going to mix. Air gets into your fermenter, and even though CO two may still be pushing out, you're still you're going to get air trapped in that fermenter right. by opening up to add add fermentation. So if fermentation is still going, you've at least got the opportunity opportunity for yeast to consume whatever oxygen was added, yeah. uh, you know, versus waiting until fermentation's fully complete and everything's all done and then opening it up and all that wa- oxygen just goes into solution and reacts uh, to make those uh, staling compounds. Yeah. And, and there's, I, I was talking with, um, I was talking privately with Scott Janish about, you know, what is causing this? Why are we seeing this more often lately? Um, I think New England IPA, most people recognize it as being a, a relatively sensitive style. Uh, and so a, a particular as it pertains to cold side oxidation, uh, that beer that I made with Jersey or the beer that Jersey made, I should say, was not a New England IPA, but it still had that that effect of turning purple and tasting absolutely wretched. Uh, and, and so that again, I'm now I'm sitting here going, all right, we've seen the pictures of what looks to be gravy on the Internet. Uh, so we know that something weird is happening that's turning beers brownish, purple, grayish color. Uh, that happened to my West Coast IPA here. Uh, what could it possibly be? And it, as it turns out, you know, you start to look at things like New England IPA in particular, and people have even pushed the boundary or pushed that dry hopping point even further towards the uh, beginning of, not beginning, but but 
closer to yeast pitch, at, at, you know, for this particular style. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, we also talk about with New England IPA, the hop load, because you, you're 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 adding a huge amount of hops to it, even more than a West Coast IPA or what what, what I would consider a standard American IPA. Right. Uh, you know, you're you're adding uh, just in uh, just massive amounts of hops uh, at the dry hop or at the whirlpool and stuff. So that comes with its own uh, oxidation issues. But yeah, people start pushing it closer and closer um, and you get to uh you know pitching uh you know why, what if we just did uh and pitched our hops at the beginning uh with uh with the with the uh you know with the yeast at at high or or uh or at the yeast pitch um earlier and earlier in the process well yeah and that was all the talk i remember uh, uh when i when this hazy new england ipa started to become a thing and a few of us were sitting back scratching our heads saying, okay, why, where is it getting this, this haze from, you know, and, and everyone's heard the argument that it was lazy brewers. We now understand that that is not the case. No one here is going <laughs> right. to accuse, uh, you know, hazy IPA brewers of being lazy by any means. Uh, but it was an interesting thing in the beginning because it didn't make sense. You know, why are people intentionally brewing this at the time, not terribly attractive looking beer that people seem to find very attractive nowadays. Uh, but one of the, one of the things that they were talking about was a dry hop addition made at high Croizen. So, you know, 24 hours ish after yeast pitch. Uh, and one of, one of the arguments was that there was something else occurring, uh, which we, called biotransformation uh, that is that may be affecting appearance but also flavor and aroma in ways that you can't uh, or that, that, that don't get uh, you're, you're creating flavors and aromas that you can't get by adding dry hops later in the process yeah and this is something there's a whole chapter about this in Scott's book uh, which is also I, I said it before on the podcast it's just a fantastic book oh yeah uh, so so go pick it up um, and you know a lot of what I'm talking about uh, here on the podcast is studies that are directly listed in his book uh, that I found out about because of his book. Uh, but yeah, biotransformation is, uh, it can be incredibly complicated and and we don't fully understand it yet. Um, so our, uh, the easiest way we can talk about bio, biotransformation is just simply that the yeast that's still active is reacting with the hops to form new flavor and aroma compounds. Um, so there's a bunch of compounds that are that are in hops uh, that aren't uh, that are uh, we'll call them inert. Uh, they're they're not inert because they're going to react, but maybe they don't have a uh, a flavor characteristic, right? Uh, so it's this compound that's just sort of floating around in beer that's not really doing anything. It's not hurting anything. It's just kind of hanging out. Uh, well, when that hop compound comes into contact with yeast, that compound uh, through a chemical reaction breaks down into a fermentable sugar, a hop oil, and a mo molecule of water. Um, so what's fascinating about this is uh, suddenly, you know, uh, you have this issue of a fermentable sugar. Well, OK, that means the yeast can now consume that sugar. And if there's still active yeast, you've got hop creep or, um, and an increased alcohol content. So some people that were adding dry hops at the end of fermentation uh, were starting to see that their beers were in the package continuing to ferment, uh, which was creating this hop creep, um, you know, reports of cans exploding and of bottles exploding and all that right. kind of stuff, uh, you know, and that, so th that's an issue. But then there's also a hop oil that's released. There's actually an aromatic compound that gets released as a result of that process. Uh, so it, it changes the actual flavor uh, of the beer, depending on when you add that hop. So, you know, if you add that, it, it, adding that specific hop later when there's not active yeast is not going to result in this specific aromatic compound that gets released. And there's a bunch of different ones is too too complicated to go into uh, uh, for this you know for 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 our purposes today but there's a whole bunch of stuff out there and there's a ways there are ways that the hops react with that yeast uh, that cause compounds to, and cause the beer to taste different than if you added it at different at different at times. And that's what we talk about with any IPA. Uh, a lot of people believe that some of the haze, especially is, is because of that biotransformation, right? Uh, because that yeast is uh, is coming into contact with that hop compound and creating uh, these different chemicals and, and different compounds and different flavors that are large that people really enjoy. Yeah, and they actually really like, you know, I mean, I love I, I was an any IPA hater 
um, whenever I first uh, whenever I first started trying them because I like clear beer, uh, like I think you do, Marshall. <laughs> but I love, I, I, but I'll drink them now. I mean, every brewery's got one, and there's a reason because they're actually good. I like to drink them. So I yeah. think every brewery's got about five of them actually. Well, that's, at this uh, point. that's a good point. <laughs> but, at this point yeah. but for the same reason, because people are paying for it, and it's obviously a style that's not going away anytime soon. Uh, like you mentioned, and I, I think it's important to reiterate this with biotransformation. There's a lot of talk lately about in order for biotransformation to occur, it's, it only occurs with certain terpenes or hop oils or something like that. Not all hops can lead to biotransformation is what I've been told. I know that there's a lot of research going on with that right now, but a, another huge benefit to dry hopping at high Croix, and again, particularly for New England IPA, is that it any oxygen introduced during that process is very easily taken up by the yeast. Unlike trying to plan out waiting for the end of fermentation and like with Jersey, we kind of missed it. You know, fermentation was already done, um, you know, over the 80% that I prefer at least. Um, and so you run the risk when you're doing that, you run the risk of oxidizing that beer. Well, with New England IPA, you're adding it early enough to where you really don't have to worry about it much at all. At least that's the talk. And then again, if you're using, uh, if you're using, you know, really good packaging processes and, and reducing as much oxygen exposure out there, you're more likely to produce a beer that people want to drink that doesn't taste horrible. <laughs> Oxidized beer is not good. I mean, that's exactly the argument. I mean, you make the argument for, for dry hopping at yeast pitch, right? Why would somebody want to dry hop at yeast pitch? Well, because of that. You protect against oxidation and oxidation causes staling and makes the beer taste gross after a few weeks of, of, of sitting. You know, so if I can add yeast or if I can add my hops uh, earlier in the process and still get the same uh, flavors uh, and aromas out of the hops then and protect against oxidation, that's great. Then we also learn about this concept like biotransformation. Hey, maybe that means I can get some different flavors out of the hops than I otherwise would have makes my beer different and makes my beer taste better. Right. So that's, I mean, that's a hundred percent the argument for, uh, or at least, you know, several pros uh, for trying to dry hop earlier in fermentation. Well, and and so I, I've told this story uh, a few times when when presenting at certain events. In fact, I just told it to a homebrew club last week. Um, I, if I've mentioned it on the show, I'm going to tell the story again. About 10 years ago, I was teaching a buddy of mine. His name is Chris Padalinski uh, to brew. And we came up with this really nice recipe that we ended up calling Smiling Sky Pale Ale, which as an aside is available to our patrons. It was a really delicious beer. Uh, anyways, this was the first time we were brewing it. And and uh, it was Chris's first time making an IPA. So I, again, I wanted to kind of let him do it, have his way with it. And he did a great job. Well, at the end of the brew day, while the wort was transferring from the kettle to the fermenter, I heard some crying coming from inside. And so I ran in to take care of my kids to help my wife out on a brew day. Uh, but when I came back out, everything was cleaned up. That's just how Chris, my buddy is, cleaned everything up, was all set. And after thanking Chris for, for doing that, I, I noticed, his, you know, he told me that he already added the dry hop edition. I saw some cut open uh, hop packs sitting on the workbench and I'm going, what, what are these? We already added all the kettle hops. And he says, well, I was looking at the recipe and it had this a dry hop edition. So I just threw them in there. Uh, we hadn't even pitched the yeast yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, this I'm sitting there going, I still till this day when I hear the idea of adding your dry hop charge at yeast pitch, there's kind of this like, it doesn't make sense to me kind of twinge <laughs> that I, that I experienced. <laughs> so he did that and not wanting to dump this, you know, back the six gallons of, of wort that we had just made, I figured we roll with it and see see how it turns out. And lo and behold, the beer was just as hoppy as you'd expect. Uh, there was no oxidation. It, it was really good and it turned out. And that was the first experience I had where I'm going, man, all of this stuff that I've learned about dry hopping why you know where what what is the difference between adding it at yeast pitch adding it later um, and this was far before I'd even heard of adding hops at high croissant it worked out and and that was such a learning experience for me that ultimately ended up you know influencing conversations that I had with with uh, some other contributors who, who ended up wanting to test it out I, it, it just makes so much sense you know <laughs> well there were some things about th this that I was concerned about you know as this beers fermenting for the following week I'm going there's got to be reasons you you know, that, that we add dry hops when we do. And some of my concerns were that the, all of the hop aromatics were going to get blown out of the airlock. I mean, that was one of the things you'd hear all the time. Uh, or that just the their presence in the beer for that much longer, an entire week longer than usual, was in some way going to uh, minimize their, their flavor and aroma impact. Uh, and again, I, I hadn't compared them. Uh, the, uh, a beer that was dry hopped at yeast pitch to one that hadn't been next to each other. But after telling that story, 
about Chris uh, and our successful Smiling Sky Pale Ale incident to previous contributor Greg Foster. He was curious how it would work out in a New England IPA and put it to the test. Results when we return. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at checkout out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical Growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. Of the many things New England IPA is known for, its remarkable sensitivity to oxygen is close to the top as it can turn a hazy juice bomb into a cloying mess in a matter of days. One way brewers of this style reduce exposure to oxygen is by adding the dry hop charge fairly early in the fermentation process, with some even tossing hops in at yeast pitch to eliminate the need to open the fermenter at all during fermentation. Contributor Greg Foster was curious what, if any, impact this has and tested it out. Yeah, I love the I love this experiment again. I you know trying this out in a New England IPA at yeast pitch I think was uh, was was beautiful. So, uh, Greg uh, brewed a single ten gallon batch of any IPA, which was a super simple recipe: eighty five percent two row uh, pale malt uh, and fifteen uh, percent flake oats, uh, which is just a super simple any ipa recipe uh i think some ipa some any ipas recipes have gotten a little bit more complex but this one's is uh is fantastic even adding like flaked wheat and things but yeah, uh, we should probably say that this this experiment was way back in uh, june of 2017 kind of you know new england ipa wasn't brand new but we were still trying to figure out what exactly this new style was so yeah exactly and i mean that's still a, i mean I, I think that's still a recipe that you uh, uh, still a grist uh, that you could use in an any ipa if you wanted to uh but yeah so he did that. So he uh, mashed in at 150 F or 66 C for 60 minutes. Uh, he then boiled it for 60 minutes um, and then uh, added a concentrated hop extract um, at 60 minutes and then uh, Citra and Simcoe at 10 minutes. Now for five gallon batches, those were five grams of the hop extract or five and a half gallon batches. Uh, that was five grams of the extract at 60 minutes and 14 grams each of Citra and Simcoe at 10 minutes. Uh, so then uh, after boiling, uh, he uh, chilled the wort and split it evenly between two fermentation kegs uh, for an original gravity of one 0.056. Now he didn't uh, at the time do any whirlpool hops, which I think is very common uh, for New England IPAs. Uh, but I, I I believe that was intentional. Um, I obviously wasn't around for those conversations, but I believe that was intentional. Uh, 
so that we could focus specifically on the characterization of uh, dry hop uh, so that there wasn't any crossover between hops that were added at the Whirlpool versus hops at dry hop. Right, right. Um, so again, it was a 1.056 uh, original gravity. Uh, he started a starter of Y yeast 1318 uh, London Ale 3, which is a very typical New England IPA yeast, and uh, split that between uh, each batch. And so it's at this point that he added the variable. Uh, so he measured out two identical dry hop charges. Uh, he vacuum sealed one, uh, while the other one immediately went into uh, the fermenter at yeast pitch. Uh, so uh, he fermented the beers then at 65F, uh, 18C, and then after four days, added the uh, dry hop charge to the batch that didn't get uh, the dry hop charge at yeast pitch. Now, um, he did purge the purge, uh, the fermenter with CO2 first to try to minimize any oxidation uh, impact, but nevertheless added uh, the dry hops, uh, you know, per standard procedures uh, per, per what I think most people would do just popping open the fermenter and adding uh, the dry hops. Yeah. And he's Greg is a, a um, just a nut when it comes to doing what he can to reduce cold side oxidation anyways. So I believe he like purged a bag, the the dry hop bag that had been holding the, the second edition uh, and, and added those as gently as he could to ensure as little contact with oxygen as possible. Cause the idea for this experiment was to see if there wasn't something different happening uh, when you add those, those dry hops at yeast pitch so that they're they're fermented along with the beer. Uh, and so again, he Greg took every effort to reduce uh, oxygen exposure in the that second beer uh, that he could. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. We want to try to isolate the variable here. So uh, so after he pitched uh, or after he uh, dry hopped, he at, he raised the temperature to 70 F or 21 C and let the beer sit for a week uh, before f- taking hydrometer measurements, uh, which I think also is uh, is important for this one. He let the beer sit for some time mm-hmm. uh, on, on dry hops. Uh, and uh, so he took a hydrometer measurement and there was a small difference, but not too drastic. Uh, the one that was dry hopped at yeast pitch uh, got a 1.008 uh, final gravity versus the one that was a standard dry hop, which was a 1.07 uh, final gravity. Uh, so I, I find this interesting because you talk about one of the issues with biotransformation is adding a fermentable sugar. Uh, you know, when when the yeast comes in contact with the the hops, and so to me, this seems like it should have been flipped a little bit. Like the dry hop at yeast pitch should have had a lower final gravity, um, but who knows? That that's I'm in the same boat. Uh, you know, you talk about hop creep and this idea that when you when you add a big dry hop charge, that you're actually kind of uh, facilitating or encouraging a little bit more fermentation. Uh, so the fact that the standard dry hop finished one FG lower than the dry hop at yeast pitch beer. I'm inclined to think that that's just something else uh, that there, but, but I mean, with as controlled as Greg was when approaching this experiment, it may very well be that something about dry hop timing uh, has a, has an effect like this on attenuation. So who, who really knows? I mean, uh, but an interesting finding nonetheless. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so after that, he uh, cold crashed for a couple of days before pressure, pressure transferring to both kegs. Uh, he also uh, f- uh, filled or uh, fined with gelatin, uh, which I don't think many people are doing with New England IPAs these days. But. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Because <laughs> I, I remember back uh, when, when Greg was contributing and, uh, you know, our standard approach, because we wanted to present good looking beers again, good looking being very relative to the time in which we were, we were brewing these. Um, we just gelatin find everything because we'd done so many experiments showing that it doesn't seem to have any impact on a uh, beer character. You know, um, the clear beer tastes exactly the same as the hazy one. And so if we preferred a good looking beer, we would, we would find it with gelatin. Uh, we've obviously, we've done some gelatin finding experiments on new England IPA at this point. It doesn't seem to have the impact that, that we would like in making it clear that the, the beer stays hazy. Uh, what it does seem to do is pull out perhaps some of the, uh, stuff that we don't like in the beer. So maybe suspended yeast or, uh, possibly this was a, a hypothesis post by a reader a while back that it may actually help decrease uh, the the oxidative effect as well. That something that the gelatin is pulling out is that thing that reacts in the way we don't like with with oxygen. I don't know, but but Greg did go and find these beers and, and believe me, he got an earful from, from readers when he did. I don't think that that hurts 
uh, this particular experiment because the variable really didn't have much to do with how the beer looked. Well, it, in fact, I think it I think it actually really helped this experiment for a reason that we'll get to in in uh, in just a minute. But I think we should clarify too the experiments that we've done on New England IPA that showed that gelatin didn't really uh, do much of anything uh, were when you were standard we were doing like standard dry hopping pitches, so not dry hopping at yeast pitch, but dry hopping several days after uh, you know after fermentation or into fermentation with just a little bit of fermentation left to go right. the more sort of standard method uh and the reason why i bring this up is because uh of some of the object some of the observations uh, that you can make about these beers which i think are just are, are really fascinating but before we get there got to finish up the process uh so he cold crashed the beers and then pressure transferred them to kegs added his gelatins uh placed them in a keezer and burst carbonated them uh before uh reducing the serving pressure uh, he did let the beers condition for a few more days. Uh, so at this point, they've been sitting. Uh, the beers have been going for about three weeks or, or, or maybe close to four at this point, if I did my math right. <laughs> uh, and then he tried the beers. Uh, I'm with you that some of the uh, objectively observable uh, differences between these beers were, were pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, the first one being obviously the way the beers looked. Uh, the beer dry hopped at yeast pitch was considerably more clear than the one dry hopped four days into fermentation, which is super interesting to me even even given the fact that they were gelatin fine that didn't seem to to have much of a, a of an effect but the one that was dry hopped more normally if as it were uh you know four days into fermentation 80 percent, about 80 percent way the way through fermenting was actually hazier than the one that got a dry hop charge at yeast pitch. What the hell is going on here? I have no, I have no <laughs> idea. I would have completely expected the opposite. Yeah, I, I would have totally expected the opposite. I would absolutely have expected the one that was dry hopped at, at, at yeast pitch to be hazier uh, than, than the one with standard dry hopping practices because I've made plenty of, uh, of IPAs uh, with gelatin that turn out nice and clear yeah. uh, using standard dry hopping practices. Uh, so I, I find this one really really fascinating um and i guess all i can say to this is uh it's probably depends on the hops that were used that's right? kind of my thought as well that the the specific varieties so citra and simcoe that there's something about them uh and this sounds like a lot of conjecture because it is uh but there's something about those varieties or maybe just one of those varieties that makes it such that when you dry hop when you add those at yeast pitch that they drop out so whatever it is those haze producing proteins or whatever drop out of solution or are more readily pulled out by gelatin uh then then if you dry hop later on in the process very interesting initial observation yeah i oh and i think i guess we, one of the things we didn't talk about you just you did just spark that in my mind is uh some of those hop compounds uh, and like you said proteins uh, can attach to yeast right sure, and fall sure. out with the yeast uh so that could also be it too if the yeast has already fallen out and you're then you're adding hop compounds to some of those proteins and stuff can still be in suspension. Uh, so, yeah. and, and if that's the case, then already you've got an initial argument for dry hopping at yeast pitch. If you, again, <laughs> if you prefer clearer beer, because it, again, if that's the case and you, and these beers are taste the same or, or one tastes better to you on a subjective level, then you've already, you know, now you're, you've got less of that stuff that you may not want in solution dropping out. Plus, you're not opening your, your fermenter to add dry hop charge later on. You've got less risk of oxidation. So far, it's, this is kind of going in, in, in a positive direction. So, of course, like we always do, Greg uh, did a, his own comparison before serving these beers to, to participants. And uh, in his, despite looking as different as they did, uh, he could not tell these beers apart. He thought that he might be able to tell a difference and then proved himself wrong when attempting blind triangle test himself uh yeah he these beers tasted identical to greg i can't tell you how many times i've done that where i've like texting all, or, or uh, messaging all the all you guys uh the brute the brooker guys and saying oh i can totally tell these beers apart it's not even close not even close and uh, then i get the triangle test and i'm just wrong yeah bias, bias in action it's a it's a real thing i promise uh so uh, so greg went along and, and served these beers to 16 different participants at a homebrew club meeting out of which 11 would have needed to identify the odd beer out in order for us to say uh using our threshold of course that this was a significant experiment that that there did seem to be a perceptibly distinguishable difference between the beers but in the end 
Only six. Only six people got it. So 37.5%, which was not significant. So no. people were unable to reliably tell these beers apart. That is 37.5% uh, is right about a third of people, uh, which is what you would expect by people randomly guessing uh, what beer was different. These beers, based on these findings, again, it was one test with with one brewer and sixteen different beer drinkers. But we these beers were indistinguishable; they tasted the same. Which you consider uh, this, you know, this is a weird variable. Nobody, well, not many people back then, at least. Maybe a few more today are, but but it is not common to add your dry hop charge when you're pitching your yeast. And yet, Greg got away with doing it and and produced a beer that not only he enjoyed, but it tasted no different than the one he brewed uh, or he dry hopped later on in fermentation process. I mean, that is to me that is such a fascinating result. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm blown away, um, you know, by by this result that the, that the beers didn't taste different uh, when you add them at such a radically different part of the brewing process, right? Yeah, yeah. When, yeah adding this before yeast pitch, before yeast even has the ability to, you know, get going in there and and do its thing and make alcohol, uh, and, and or adding it, at, you know, towards the tail end of fermentation, and it tastes exactly the same. And then one of them is noticeably clearer, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so I mean. All of the claims that New England IPA has to be hazy, um, you know, I think it depends, right? <laughs> it depends on when you're adding the hops. I, you know, I was just I was so fascinated by this experiment. I just thought that that was uh, I thought it was really interesting. And I mean, again, I will caveat this by saying that it, this experiment is very unique to the hops that were used, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, we know for a fact, based on the science, that that uh, hops react differently uh, to biotransformation. Just like you said, there has to be certain terpenes and stuff uh, in the in the hop for it to even have a biotransformation uh, component. Right. And there's, you know, um, th- this whole concept of biotransformation, we could go down that that rabbit hole, and we have in past episodes. There's some question as to whether or not the biotransformation that does occur uh, when dry hopping earlier in fermentation, uh, whether it's actually perceptible or if the change is occurring, but it's on such a small level that you may not even be able to, to, to perceive it. Uh, we've done biotransformation experiments. We will do more. Uh, but in those ones, it would seem to suggest that the perceptible difference is, well, it's not very perceptible, uh, that you can't really taste or smell a difference. Uh, now, again, there are certain things we've learned, uh, certain, I believe, I believe it's linalool is one that is known to in the presence of certain yeast strains that have the capacity to biotransform uh, linalool will will convert to citronellol or something like that which is highly desired in these new juicy new england ipas uh and so it, you got to pick hop varieties that have higher levels of that or i I've got, i think mike tonsmeyer was telling me when we were back in new zealand that he made a an ipa where he put coriander or something along those lines some spice which is known to have higher levels of that that particular uh, oil, linalool, uh, and and his his idea was well if we can if we can force biotransformation using things that may not be hops but have that same compound, how cool would that be? Uh, I would say if you want to know the results of Tonsmeyer's experiment, uh, pick up Janish's book um, because I think he talks about that uh, specifically in the biotransformation chapter. Don't remember off the top of my head what they were, but I know he talks about it. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that it it, it really is. It, I, and I, I started off the episode by talking about how interesting it is and how we can add hops at different parts of the brewing process to result in different things, uh, you know, different flavors, different aromas, different bitterness, different character of the beer. And I just think this is so fascinating that you can add ye- add hops at yeast pitch at yeast pitch uh, to to eliminate oxygen increase, maybe improve the stale, the the lasting ability of your beer, the stability of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so and still get that same dry hop character, which I just think is so fascinating. Uh, so definitely, definitely one I'd love to see. I'd love to see like an overtime um, experiment of this, of how yeah. the beers changed over time. That'd just be so fun to see. Absolutely, and, and you know, thinking of that that experience that I had with Chris, where he dry hopped it early, and you know, you know, I was like, oh man. We we were supposed to do that a couple couple days from now, and he's sitting there like, "Oh shoot, I you know I messed up this beer," but he didn't. It came out good, and since then, I've dry hopped at yeast pitch a handful of times, usually uh, as a part of some other like sh- maybe a short and shoddy batch, or I'm, I'm just messing around trying to experiment with new things. And in every scenario, 
the beer comes out tasting like it was dry hopped. I mean, it's not diminishing that dry hop character. If anything, I actually seem to, my experience is that it kind of amplifies things a little bit. Um, I I still, when I think about dry hopping at yeast pitch, I still have that little tinge of, huh? (laughs) Like that doesn't sound right. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who feel in the same way. Uh, Give it a shot. You know, if you're struggling with, this is, this is my own, my own thinking on it, but if you're struggling with oxidized IPA or you're not getting the hop character that you're expecting uh, when you're when you're dry hopping a more more standard approach. Maybe try tossing in your dry hops at yeast pitch, uh, or try, toss in a dose a dose at yeast pitch and another one at high croix and something like that. You may be surprised with the with the uh, findings. I think a lot of people who are reading this one uh, were equally as surprised as we are. Now we do have a lot of reader uh, reader comments. I'm going to get to the first one here. It comes from James. He says, "Thanks for this one. I've never attempted to dry hop at pitch and have always gone after primary fermentation. I'm interested." to see this as a means to cut overall conditioning time for dry hopped beers as I could cut straight to cold crash rather than a three-day pause at 14C, which I believe is 57F or so, uh, post-fermentation, potentially with a clearer beer at the end of things. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you don't have to sit and wait for for uh, the dry hop addition uh, at the end, you know, you added it at the tail end of fermentation, then you still have to wait a couple of days to make sure you extracted all of the flavor components that you want out of it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, that can certainly cut off three or four days off of a brew schedule, especially if you're a commercial a commercial brewer, three or four days off of a beer uh, means you can brew several more batches a year yeah. <laughs> of that uh, of that batch. So, uh, yeah, that's a that's a that could be a huge uh implication for this. Well, and I like what James is saying here. Uh, Also, in in my thinking, if you're adding those hops at yeast pitch, the base beer isn't going to be as old, which we, you know, multier that that multi character sense tends to kind of come out more over time as the hop character starts to drop off, which is just normal uh, for hoppier beers. Well, you get that thing in the keg three, four days earlier than you normally would. Ostensibly, your beer is fresher and you're going to have arguably a similar dry hop character. I mean, I I think (laughs) when you really start thinking about it and you and you kind of put these results over practice. I mean, it is kind of an interesting uh, approach to consider for people who are looking to get those beers out of their fermenters quicker. Uh, seems to me like it might it might yield a fresher result, which I think is pretty neat. All right. Uh, Alex said, doesn't doesn't adding hops, which may have bacteria living on them, to the otherwise sanitized environment of the fermenter risk bacterial contamination of the beer? I understand that if you add them later on, the lower pH and higher alcohol levels inhibit bacteria growth, uh, but at the start of fermentation, conditions are right for bacteria to grow. Uh, isn't that why we are all so obsessive about sanitation? What a fantastic question, Alex. Oh, man, that, that is such a fantastic question, and so much like, I mean, that's almost a whole episode that you you could go into there (laughs) um you know i mean uh, picking apart the question i think you answered it partially yourself and then asked some other questions uh you know which i think there may not be clear answers to but uh the first question that you asked is alcohol and low ph uh does definitely inhibit bacteria growth and so as as yeast are doing their thing and are creating alcohol that's making it harder and harder for bacteria to grow the other thing is yeast act to act really quickly um, if it, you know, we, we talk about it all the time, pitching yeast, especially with the, you know, the Imperial yeast, fresh pitches, uh, you're getting activity and fermentation sometimes within as little as like six to eight hours. Oh yeah. Right. Um, so, so yeast, yeast goes really quickly and, and, uh, that means if there's CO2 coming out and there's fermentation activity, there's alcohol that's being produced, mm-hmm. uh, which, which makes it really difficult for, for bacteria to grow. Um, bacteria is generally slower uh to grow depending on the conditions uh you know bacteria i think functions better at at warmer conditions not necessarily at like the 60 to 70 uh temperature range where most ales are fermenting and certainly not at the you know traditional lager temperatures of 40s or 50s all that's fahrenheit by the way um you know so you, you you answered the question partially but then raised a bunch of other questions to uh, really complicated answer but maybe a couple of those things will stick out as as uh, as reasons There's a couple of things that I just mentioned I mean so I, I don't have the 
the, the, the intelligence to answer this one with any degree of confidence. Uh, I do believe that hops in general tend to have antiseptic properties so that, you know, that the, any bugs that are on them, uh, are, are taken care of fairly quickly. I don't know that for sure. What I can say is that in my experiences of dry hopping at yeast pitch, I've not had any issues with contamination uh, from doing that. I it may very well be because of like what you said, Cade, that the that fermentation is starting so quickly and the alcohol is being produced and the pH is being reduced uh, that that it takes care of any potential spoilage uh, that might have occurred in the first place. I, I I honestly don't know. Has not been my anecdotal experience that it's that it's anything to concern concern yourself with uh, at this point. Uh, but I but I would caution you know. Uh, uh, pitch or, or, you know, pitch as much fresh yeast as you possibly can. Cause I think that that does help a lot. I can imagine that if you're dry hopping at yeast pitch and then you, you know, you sprinkle on a, a four year old pack of SO five or something like that, uh, that maybe your experience won't, won't match mine. So, uh, mad dog says I have experimented a bit with timing of the dry hop additions. And the only caveat I have to offer is that just after max fermentation seems to be the best time. I added one batch at peak fermentation, and I believe a lot of hop material blew out and ended up not in the beer. Usually day two seems about right. I'm not sure if Mad Dog, when he says that the hop material blew out, if he means like it actually, he had a blow off and a bunch of that dry hop material left with the Kroizen, or if he meant like what I was talking about earlier, those hop aromas get blown out of the airlock. Um, um, if you've ever worked in a cellar in a commercial brewery uh, for any length of time, you've probably seen a tank geyser or have at least heard stories about it happening. Um, yeah. So if, if, yeah, if you're adding hops at high Croissant, uh, that hop, it, the, all that hop material is going to become a nucleation site for CO2, um, uh, where that CO2 is going to coagulate and then cause uh, the pressure to build inside the tank and then blow, right? Or not necessarily explode, but to push all that pressure out. So if you've got a blow off tube connected to it, you are, and all that hot material is going to sit right on top of that croissant and then blow right out of that blow off tube. Uh, so if that's what he was talking about, then yeah, I could certainly see that, you know, adding it at high Krausen and then causing that, that big pressure release uh to happen um creating a geyser in the tank that could certainly happen yeah uh, yeah. you know to blow off hops but the the first the the first comment that that uh you know the timing uh, that that you adding it just after max fermentation produces the best beer. Uh, great. I mean, if that's what you like, that's fantastic. Right. I think there are going to be people that are going to argue that that there are uh, other times that they like to add it that's the best for them. Right. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, this is why we talk about this issue. There's so many different ways to add it and to and to uh, produce a really good beer. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. I, I again, uh, if you are referring to uh, the blow off of aromatic, you know, oils or how, I guess whatever it is, those aromatic compounds coming out of the airlock, that is just not something we've been able to replicate or reproduce in our own experiments on specifically when we're trying to do it. So I'm just not too sure that that actually happens. Uh, I don't. It, I, it makes sense to me that that maybe there's, uh, you know, some sort of loss happening. Like when you blow off a keg, um, and you get it smells like hops. Well, if it's if it's in your nose, then it's not in the beer. That whole argument. I'm just we've not been able to reproduce it, so I'm not terribly concerned with it. I guess. But all right. Final comment comes from Thomas Barbara. Uh, a, a, he says a brewery in U- in the UK called Cloudwater did the same experiment with their NEIPA versions four and five, the result was clearly the same as yours. The beer dry hopped during conditioning was much hazier than the one dry hopped at yeast pitch. Fascinating that a commercial brewery would run the, run the risk of experimenting like this, but I think that's awesome. Oh, that's that's uh, that's fantastic and good on them uh, for doing experimentation uh, in the brewery. I think that's how you make better beer. Uh, but that's that's fascinating that a commercial brewery actually replicated the exact same results with the clarity and everything. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, that's really cool to think that you can add dry hops at yeast pitch, potentially have better stability, get the same dry hop character, uh, not have to deal with all the oxidation issues and still get a clear beer. Um, yeah. Like I said, I like clear beer. Uh, I I kind of want to brew a beer like this and uh, take it around and show some people and call it an any IPA and watch all of them frown because it's not hazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's because sometimes it's fun. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it is weird that I mean, I'm still hung up on this that w- w- the beers that are dry hopped earlier are dropping clear again. You, I mean, you mentioned that that perhaps 
certain, you know, polyphenols are attaching to uh, the yeast and then that yeast drops out along with those. So it, it, it just, it's kind of a, a filtration uh, process, but a fascinating result. Nonetheless, the fact people could not tell a difference between these beers, the fact that I've been relatively pleased with the outcome of my beers that I dry hop at yeast pitch. I think it's a viable method and one that can uh, help to reduce the risk of cold side oxidation for brewers of these big old New England IPAs. Well, Cade, that brings us to the end of yet another episode. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we sign off? Yeah, it was just this is a really easy one to test at home, right? Everybody that's doing dry hop additions, this is super easy for you to test. Yeah. Uh, you know, brew a batch and and pitch it at yeast pitch, and then brew another batch and piss, pitch it at the end. Uh, so uh, if you don't trust us, or if you don't want to, uh, you know, again, we're not making any recommendations based on our based on on this. Uh, but if you don't trust the results, do it for yourself and see what comes up, and then let us know. There's nothing wrong with a little experimentation. In fact, it can be quite fun. All right, don't forget, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.